Um, so since um, my PhD days, I was very interested in how Indians looked at um, Japanese conceptions of sovereignty and particularly the political theological ways in which they interpreted the relation between the Japanese emperor, the Japanese people and Shintoism. And um, I thought that Japan was, for many Indian anti-colonial nationalists, a very ambiguous, even schizophrenic and ambivalent model of sovereignty. On the one hand, they wanted to um, establish an Indian national state similar to the Japanese national state, dependent on some kind of political theological bond between the ruler and the people, which could transcend the rule of the machine uh, technocracy, which many Indians saw in British modes of rule, uh, whether in terms of governmentality or the rule of the plantation, the factory, and so on. Um, however, at the same time, particularly after the Japanese um, colonialism in Korea, but also especially from the 1910s and of course from the 1930s, uh, many Indian nationalists felt that Japan was also a model of sovereignty which replicated European models of sovereign violence, racism and imperialism. So it was also a very negative model of what Indians should not be. So the whole question, can you become independent in an anti-colonial mode? Uh, or, uh, or, and, and what would happen to sovereignty in that way? Would you merely translate um, sovereignty, just merely continue Western models of racism, imperialism, sovereign violence, or are more emancipatory models of sovereignty and political authority possible? Japan was the very ambiguous mirror through which many Indians thought about sovereignty. And this question, which I think has not been adequately examined in previous scholarship, led me to the next moment, which was this 1940s moment, this very explosively um, troubled moment of the Tokyo trial, uh, where the Indian judge gives this fantastically interesting um, judgment um, about um, the, the war crimes of the Japanese. And I think the reason previous scholars have focused in uh, not enough adequate ways have been because they have been interested in legal and political histories of the trial. Uh, also, of course, on issues about colonialism and anti-colonialism, but they have not probed very deeply into the global intellectual history um, of the trial itself and including the interventions of the Indian judge. But if you look at it from an intellectual history perspective and actually bring into conversation all the different parts of his works together into a continuum, see, for example, how his perspectives on uh, Vedic ideas of law, on Christian ideas of natural law, on, on various kinds of ideas of post-colonial justice, human rights, all of these actually imbricate and inform each other, you get a much more complex understanding of what he actually means by global justice. And you also see why his very ambiguous relationship to Japanese sovereignty and sovereign violence actually stems from a basic contradiction within anti-colonial Indian thinking itself. A contradiction which sees sovereignty as a kind of necessary evil in order to prevent a kind of monstrous super imperialism, a neo-colonialism. So non-Europeans need sovereignty. But they also see that this is, um, in a way, the, um, let's say, the forbidden apple. If, if you consume it, you're going to be destroyed by it because you are going to replicate colonial violence. So let me begin with the Paul's judgment and how previous scholars have looked at his conceptions of sovereignty. I would say there are three or four main strands. One strand is that Paul represents an anti-colonial position uh, based on positive law, which is that non-European states, example Japan, but it also example other states, um, their sovereignty needs to be protected from the kind of neo-colonial ideas of natural law, which are being propagated by the allied powers. Uh, now, some scholars see this in a very positive way, that Paul is a kind of a volatile proponent of third world international law. Um, others see it in a much more negative and critical way. So Paul is presented as somebody who believes in sovereignty, which is antithetical to our modern understandings of the universalism of international criminal and humanitarian law. Um, there is a smaller group of people who think that Paul represents a kind of Hindu mythic religious perspective which is absolutely contradictory to Western understandings of good and evil on which Western models of sovereignty are based. But this is rather a minority position and it's based often more on um, impressionistic uh, judgments rather than on very detailed analysis.
What I would argue is that if you look at the entire corpus of Pal's writings in granular detail, you find that he has at least two subjectivities. On the one hand, he's extremely anti-sovereignty. Um, he's almost a bit like a, a, a polar twin of Carl Schmidt in a very different way. So there is this very anti-sovereignty perspective in Paul, um, where he, we, he goes back to ancient Indian Vedic ideas of Rita, um, European Christian ideas, for example, um, St. Thomas Aquinas' idea of um, a natural law and, deo, um, and ratio in Deo existence, the reason which exists in the mind of God. He goes back to these ideas in order to uncouple justice or law from sovereignty, divine or human, from state power. On the other hand, he has this alternate perspective because he's very fearful of European neocolonial sovereignty. In the Tokyo moment and later as well, in a way he provides an apologetics for non-European sovereignty, even arguably for non-European sovereign violence, because he sees it as a necessary evil in order to protect non-European societies from the aggression of Western powers. Now, this kind of bifurcated model of sovereignty, on the one hand, you're pro-sovereignty, on the one hand, you're also anti-sovereignty. Uh, in a way, this stems from a bifurcation in anti-colonial Indian thinking as well. And this brings me to the broader question of sovereignty now. Uh, now, there is a latent assumption that decolonization simply meant translation of sovereignty. One a group of sovereign powers, um, the Europeans, they were displaced, and another group of ruling classes, the new sovereigns, the post-colonial sovereigns, they came into power. So when he's talking about sovereignty, he's defining it not only as something characterizing European states, but also as something characterizing um, rulers of Turkey, Ethiopia, India, and, and, and so on. So he already has a global picture in mind. Um, what happens in the 19th and 20th centuries, of course, you have a transplantation of certain models of centralized um, state sovereignty by the colonizers to the colonized. How do the colonized react? In the case of India, many of them, of course, kind of try to indigenize models of sovereignty. They go back to concepts dating back two or three thousand years to say that we had something similar uh, in our pre-colonial past. So if you look at a lot of Indian languages, the word for sovereignty um, is related to the Sanskrit word Sarvabhauma, which means lord of all land. And this is a term which dates back at least 3000 years, uh, but it's now translated as a kind of lineage, uh, a predecessor, a prefiguration of the model of national sovereignty. So they argue, let's say that, you know, our indigenous rulers had also constructed national sovereignty. We have lost that because of the British, but in the future to come, we will regain this national sovereignty. But then you have other views. You have other views which say, no, sovereignty in the way that the Europeans have organized it is evil. It's monstrous. It has led to extermination of peoples, for example, of the Native Americans. It has led to colonialism. It, it, it is fundamentally uh, untainable. Um, you have other examples, um, for example, among lower caste, peasant, and so-called tribal populations, which talk about sovereignty often in a, in a very different way, by negotiating collectivist communitarian models of autonomy with notions of peasant empowerment, individuated ethics, and so on. So there's a very from below subaltern perspectives on sovereignty as well, which have enormous political implications but often they have not been given adequate recognition. And I think if you want to look at Paul's contradictory understandings of, of sovereignty, on the one hand, he's anti-sovereignty, he's, he's pro-global justice, he's pro-natural law, pro-Vedic ideas of Rita. On the other hand, he gives this very ethically problematic apologetics trying to protect the Japanese political military leadership and the sovereignty structure of Japan. All these contradictions one has to place within this wide vary of thinking. Because if we want to build political theory and critical theory, which informs critical politics from below, from the ground up, a political theory which is not only about Hobbes, but is also about the actual lived experiences, revolutionary insurgent politics of the multitudes in varied parts of the world. We need to understand how they think about sovereignty and political authority, whether they reject it, transform it, disrupt it, collectivize it. And it is to build up this enormous amount of political thinking that I think global historians and global intellectual historians have an enormous duty and imperative to do. And it is for our generation, I think, to intervene within, to build up, to use global history as a political tool,
to build up a new politics nourished by all these different kinds of critical thinking produced by subalternized populations all across the world. So what we see in PAL is a very contradictory perspective on sovereignty. Um, on the one hand, um, it seems to be pro-sovereignty. It seems to try to protect um, the structure of sovereignty of the Japanese political military leadership and, and, and to argue that just because the Allied powers have conquered Japan, sovereignty of the conquered country has not been transferred to the conquered powers. And this is a position different from, let us say, that of the Australian Catholic judge William Webb, who argues that in a just war, occupatio bellica, occupation of a country, uh, transfers the rights of sovereignty of the conquered country to the conqueror. And of course, for Paul, this is anathema. Uh, that the conqueror, the colonial conqueror, uh, can just, uh, by virtue of conquest, uh, get the sovereignty uh, of the nation to their own hands. Pal is absolutely against this. Uh, so he wants to protect the sovereignty structure of, of the Japanese state, which leads him to this very morally problematic position where he tries to minimize or negate the guilt of the Japanese top political military leadership. But on the other hand, in the judgment, we see a double move. Because Paul is also speaking against sovereignty. There's a very interesting passage where he says, actually, I myself am not in love with national sovereignty. And especially, even more than national sovereignty, he's against the kind of neo-colonial, uh, super-imperial sovereignty, the kind of sovereignty of rules, of regulations, or in this case of international criminal law regulations, which one could perhaps think about in relation to the Hart and Negri understanding of empire. This stems from a long tradition of anti-colonial Indian thinking. So for Paul, colonialism, of course, has multiple connotations, political, economic, legal, juridical, etc. One interesting argument is about the very act of law giving. So it is widely known that when the British came to India, there was no systematic, homogenized, centralized codes of law present. There are multiple religious communities, castes, etc. had different customary norms and so on. So one of the ways the British actually tried to create a scaffold of a sovereign state by homogenizing, uh, to a great extent, uh, the very act of law giving. And the British would often argue that what Indians had before the British came was not really true law because it was not the command of a centralized sovereign. Paul inverts this entirely. Paul says, rubbish. It is not true that the centralized state sovereign has to be the true lawgiver. Rather, if we look at ancient India, at Vedic India and the concept of Ritha, or to pre-modern Europe and the concept of natural law, the idea of ratio in deo existence, the reason in the mind of God, and so on, we find an idea of justice, of natural law, which is actually anterior to the idea of human state sovereignty and positive law. So what Paul does is to uncouple the relation between sovereignty and law, uh, which the British had created, which Paul saw in certain very negative aspects of Indian Hindu law giving as well as pre-modern Christian understandings of law and legal theology. Paul wants to uncouple that relation. So there is that aspect of speaking against legal colonialism. But of course, Paul is also very much thinking of inequality, socioeconomic inequalities, which even if not always created by colonialism, are certainly exacerbated and accentuated by colonialism. And Paul is thinking of um, socioeconomic inequalities, gender inequalities, and so on within uh, a domestic society, for example, India, but also in the international context. And, and he develops this already from the 1920s, but also in the 1950s and 1960s, increasingly he's more and more speaking about them. So he's allying with decolonization movements in Africa and Asia, with the anti-apartheid movement, with the civil rights movement, and, and so on, because he sees decolonization as a way of overturning turning the material asymmetries of power, the brutalities that many people in the world are exterminated, their lands taken away, that they languish in hunger, all of these horrible inequalities Pal is militating against. So it, it, I think it's a very productive uh, critique of colonialism in all its manifestations. So there is a lot of very interesting debate on how to do global history is and, and many people sometimes think that in a way global history is just European imperial history writ large. I mean, there is a there is a critique like that. 
But I personally find global history very productive to think with uh, in order to think history in multiscalar ways. Uh, so for example, in the case of the Tokyo trial, global history is not only about the fact that there are 11 judges from 11 countries in this trial, um, that it, it, it is a trial with enormous implications, not only for Asia, but also for all, all across the world in terms of new understandings of global justice. It is also about the fact that with actors like Pal and so on, you find how geographically bounded local horizons of thinking actually have a revolutionary potential to transform the world. That so-called local ways of thinking also have a world historical importance. Um, the famous post-colonial theorist Partho Chatterjee has a very interesting phrase, subaltern elite. Um, elites who are subaltern in, in certain ways, obviously racially and so on, but who are elites vis-a-vis -vis their own women or lower classes and so on. And I think Judge Pal is a very interesting example of a subaltern elite. He, he comes from a lower caste Potter family, a lower class family, growing up in poverty, achieves a tremendous amount of social mobility and moves up to the very highest elite ranks of Bengali Indian society. And I would in a way argue that this subaltern elitehood contributes to the paradoxes uh, of his thinking. Because as a member of, of, of a post-colonial elite, of course he is invested in, in protecting the um, sovereignty structures of non-European societies, of decolonial societies. But on the other hand, if one contextualizes PAL within broader ambits of lower caste thinking, peasant thinking, and so on, one sees that in a way, um, he, he, his, his biography as well um, shows the deep scars of subalternity and, 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 the, uh, and the openings of insurgency. So he, he carries within himself the paradoxes uh, at, at a very microcosmic level. So in a way, um, Pal is a very interesting character because he bridges multiple worlds. But of course, as global intellectual historians, I think should do, and I have tried in a little very modest way to do this in my doctoral research, is to look at many other worlds of conceptual work. Uh, which are not at all familiar to metropolitan Western audiences. Um, and, and, and I think, in a way, what global intellectual historians should do is to do multiple things. Of course, we study male elites um, who are um, at the positions of power, but we should also think of women and, and peasants and working classes also as intellectual actors. We need to uh, disrupt the intellectual canon. We need to question actually what intellectual production is. When a peasant is plowing the land and thinking something about his or her relation to the soil, why is that not intellectual thinking? So intellectual thinking should be exposed in all its materiality. It is about modes of production and exchange and not only about a very kind of rarefied realm of thinking. So in a way, I would say intellectual history should also take into account uh, various kinds of material activity, forms of caregiving, gendered activities and many other things. It should not only be obviously about legal history and, and, and so on.